As far as becoming a ranger, I had, that wasn't in my plans at first. My plans were to, coming in as a highway patrolman in DPS, was to go up through the ranks as far as I could in highway patrol. But along the way, I uh, decided to uh, try to get into Criminal Investigations Division, which is what it's called now. Back then it was called Criminal Law Enforcement. And so I was promoted into that as a sergeant and trained as a polygraph examiner. During that period of time, I worked with a lot of rangers on different cases. And that kind of fueled the desire, along with their encouragement on trying to become a ranger. Then I took the test and was fortunate enough to make it. As far as knowing the rangers, that first two years that I was in CID, I learned a lot about the rangers then. By no means did I know it all, but working side by side in some aspects of their investigation uh, gave me a pretty good insight at the time uh, to decide to further my career, if at all possible, by becoming one. I mean, when you're looking at the Rangers and you're in DPS, I'm speaking from myself, that's kind of the pinnacle. And that's the way I looked at it. Not everybody might, but I did. And seeing the quality of the people that they had working as Rangers, there was no way I could not at least try. And I was fortunate that I was able to make it because uh, there's a lot of them that don't get that opportunity. And the and, and it, it really it kind of started early when I was a trooper uh, in Central Texas. I didn't know a whole lot about the Rangers then, you know, other than what was bounced around within the department. Um, but the place that I was at was kind of a stop off in between on the travels to Austin. And there were a couple of Rangers that uh, served in areas north and south of me. And every time they came through, and it was John Dindy and Fred Cummings, every time they came through, they made it a point to holler at that young highway patrolman and sit down, maybe have a cup of coffee if they had time, ask me how I was doing. It never was about the Rangers, it's about me. You know, how are you doing? What's going on? You know, that, that kind of stuff. And that was really my first true exposure one-on-one -on -one to rangers and it made a profound impression on me and changed my career path along the way. The reality of it was, was I had no idea how busy these folks were. I thought I was, you know, I was a hard-working highway patrolman, at least I thought I was anyway. And so I, I, I've always been kind of a hard worker, that's what I wanted to do. But when I got into the Rangers, and I worked hard in CID, but when I got into the Rangers, I'm like, oh my goodness, the amount of work that is piled on these folks and what they're able to do with it is awe-inspiring. And that was the old days as compared to what they're doing now. And I, I saw how hard they work, and then I experienced it once I became a Ranger. It's one of those where you really don't know until you get your feet wet in it. And I was like, my goodness. And I've heard that from lots of people that have made Rangers since that part in time. As they like, I didn't realize how busy y'all were. I thought y'all just sat in the offices and drove around. Oh no, 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 no. And that first couple of three years that I was a Ranger, I didn't stay in the office. I mean, that was just a stop off point to drop something off and pick something up. Uh, I had my own little office over there. I did my reports at home at night because uh, it, it was just that busy, even back then. And the amount of things that they're doing now is unreal. If you're a law enforcement officer, uh, we're all in the same boat here. We're all working for the same thing. We may have different jobs. We may work for different departments. But our purpose here is to prevent, if possible, and then also solve crimes when they do happen. We're all working for the same entity here. We're working for justice, for victims and victims' families. And I always had this, this saying, and I still use it in classes over at Baylor. I tell my students, that ego is the worst thing that can happen to anybody. And I always told people, even at the crime scenes, check your ego at the crime scene tape. There's no place for it in here. We're all working together to do this one particular job. It was a different thing happening every day, just about. You never knew if you were gonna get that 2 a.m. phone call 
saying, you know, when you've got to go to a double homicide scene or a riot situation or whatever. Um, so there's, it, it's hard to really say what a daily routine is because the sun comes up different day every day. Maybe you're lucky enough if you can plan it out and it's quiet enough, there's not a full moon or whatever, that you can go into the office and sit down with a cup of coffee and type because that is a huge portion of the job. Just working the cases doesn't mean that you still got to document them so that they can be tried down the road. That's probably 70% of the job. So from a daily aspect, no. You go out with a plan in the morning, okay, I'm gonna go to the office and I'm gonna write reports today. 10 minutes in, phone calls start coming. Somebody needs some assistance somewhere, or something along, and then your whole day is shot from that aspect because you're doing something different. So now you gotta put that off to the next day. And then the same thing happens, and over and over and over to where the, you get to the point where I'm behind. Not necessarily on investigations because you kind of always stay behind on those trying to catch up with as many as you do, but now you got paperwork to do and people want the paperwork. So there's no really ideal day. There's just quiet days and then there's the other kind of days. There's always something about every case, but I'll use this one as an example as far as standing out in my memory in that it hit close to home. Um, there was a double murder that involved, basically involved some torture involved, uh, that happened in my community. And at the time when local law enforcement got involved and they called me, they did not know where the bodies were. They knew they were missing. And they didn't know if they were deceased, but it was pretty well thought at that point that they were. And they didn't know where the suspect was. And what had happened is, is a, a husband and stepfather had systematically tortured the wife and stepdaughter and eventually killed them. And he eventually he committed suicide because we were after him and he knew that and we were getting close. And so he wound up committing suicide. But in the, port, in the process of doing that, he transported those bodies to various locations around the state while they were encased in barrels and the people that he was around did not realize that that's what was going on. The reason that that isn't as close to home case is because the 15 year old girl, uh, my wife was her teacher. And you know, I'm working that case and I'm coming home to her teacher and my wife knows what has happened. And it, you know, it hits close to home, especially in the small communities. I don't know how it would really work in, you know, Dallas, Houston, places like that, but in a small community and in a rural area, everybody knows everybody. And everybody knows you, and they know your kids, how old they are, when their birthdays are. And now that was really the first time that it really hit me hard because I saw people other than victims' families being truly affected, because it was in my house, by something that actually happened. During the course of time that I was a ranger, special duties that I was fortunate to be trained in was as a forensic hypnotist, as well as a hostage negotiator. Um, I had extra training in bloodstain pattern analysis and shooting reconstruction and uh, death investigations. And that was kind of my little niche within itself. Uh, that was something that interested me based on my educational background in the past. Um, so that's kind of what I guess you would say, it wasn't really an expertise because I don't really think there's an expert in anything, but that was, that was something I kind of gravitated to. Uh, I didn't necessarily enjoy, you don't enjoy working on cases like that because there's death involved. But if you can do it from the aspect of, I'm going to work on this case to help solve it, and then bring those people to justice that need to be held accountable for it, then that's kind of a win situation. Really and truly, everybody that I've worked with inspires me. From the past, I mean, we can read about those folks and they, they set the tone they, for everybody that's doing anything today. You know, you, you want to do better than those that came before you. That's, that's what I tell my students, do better than I did. And when I first came into the Rangers, 
I looked around at roomfuls of men and women that were just, in, in my estimation, just awesome at what they did because they were serious about their work, they took it to heart, and they were determined. And I worked hand in hand with those. And then now that I've retired and I'm watching some of the new ones come in that are coming in with so much more training and expertise than I could ever imagine. I mean, it's, kind of, it's one of those things where I want to go back to do what they're doing now because they're doing it on a totally different level than we used to do it. And I thought we were doing pretty good at the time. And now I see what they're doing now. And I'm like, you folks are awesome. I mean, if I need, I want, I want you there because I want to learn from you now, but based on what you're doing. And it's made the job more complicated for them, but it's also made them much more successful. And they're setting a whole new standard. The bar is really high now for those coming in. And now that the reputation that we used to think we needed to live up to, they're creating a whole new reputation of what's expected from a Texas Ranger. Well, as far as what I do at Baylor as a lecturer, I, I just try to give them as close of a real life experience as possible. Um, I've had classes before and I've seen people teach before and they're teaching subjects and maybe they're really good at it, but maybe they haven't actually worked those kinds of cases. So I try to bring the actual aspect of working those into the classroom and make it as real as humanly possible for them so that when they go out, they already know what to do. They've got a good idea of what they're already doing and try to give them that experience up front, especially with the type of courses that I teach, which aren't necessarily taught in a lot of places. So it just really depends. And those are the ones that I think are important so that when they walk out the doors, it'd be easier for them to find a job because they already know what they're doing, at least to some aspect. Then OJT, on the job training, can take over from there. But it gives them, I think, a leg up because they've already had some experiences they're not getting anywhere else. So that's where I try to go with it from there. I'm proud that I, was, I had the opportunity in life to be a Texas Ranger. Not many people get to do that. And I, I was just fortunate, you know, God took the wheel and pointed me in a direction that I wasn't sure that that was where I needed to go. And so, but I, I was around people uh, Rangers included that were very instrumental in what I did and how I did it and thank goodness they were because I wouldn't trade one second of it for anything else. I mean the experience, the people that I worked with, not just in the Rangers or DPS but any law enforcement uh, has been, has been awe-inspiring to me as well as being able to do something in as positive a way as you can with negative situations to be able to do something positive for society. To me, that's a very fulfilling thing.